Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. This, I believe this is our, yes, this is our final uh, panel about the manifesto here. Um, Vice President Suica, I'll start with you. Um, we heard there from a single mother earlier on, you may have seen in the video, um, from Greece, and she was talking about how her, essentially how she's concerned about how life is difficult for her, about what kind of future she'll have for her, leave for her, her child, what the shared priorities are of European Union citizens. How do you think that this manifesto um, sticks together those shared values to answer her concerns? Thank you for asking this question. Europe is uh, Europe for Europe of all ages, and this is what we are trying to sent with the message with this manifesto. It's about human capital. It's about demographic change. It's about uh, democratic resilience. So it, all of this is connected. So we realize that there is a demographic change uh, in Europe. There is demographic change uh, across the world. And we are trying to tackle this phenomenon. Maria said a few minutes ago that we want to be leaders in different sectors. Yeah. So we want to be leaders, but if the forecast is correct, by 2070, Europe will be only 4% of the world population. How are we going to be leaders in all sectors with only 4%? OK, with artificial intelligence, with robotics, with, helps, uh, with help of innovations. But we need human capital. We need people. We need families, we need parents, we need women, uh, we need all our European women to be present in the labor market. At this moment, all of them are not capable of doing it because of lack of childcare, lack of different uh, services. And this is what we are uh, trying to uh, realize during the actual mandate of this commission, but also we are proposing this through this manifesto for the new commission. Uh, we are speaking about young people. Young people, they have their diplomas, but sometimes their diplomas don't match the, the needs of the labor market yeah. because l development is uh, much faster than education. So this is a problem how to upskill, how to reskill them. And both of the categories, parents, families, and youngsters, they have one common issue, and this issue is housing. Housing becomes key issue in European Union, not only in some countries, but all over, across European Union. So we have to tackle this phenomenon. Particularly for the young vote. And? Particularly for the younger vote. Of course, yeah. especially youngsters. Yeah. And yeah. then we have older people. Someone who was, when I was young, for me, someone who was 60 was old. Nowadays, it's 80 because it's shifted. So we are not talking anymore about aging Europe, aging continent. We are talking about Europe as longevity continent because Europeans live 10 years more in the last 50 years. And this is what we have also to tackle. At this moment, we have child guarantee. We have youth guarantee, but in our manifesto, we are promising, I hope, that we will manage to do it, seniors' uh, old age guarantee to finish this triangle, to help those who are vulnerable, who are at risk of poverty. So this is something which we are dealing with, and I think this manifesto sends clear message to Europeans, to our voters. Thank you very much, Vice President Suica. Um, Vice President De Lange, um, the EPP has obviously tackled some of the big issues over the last uh, few years. Obviously, one of them that gains a lot of traction with the young is climate change, so digitization, which we spoke about briefly in the previous panel. Um, how, how does this manifesto address those particular concerns? For as we were saying before, the different age groups as well. Yeah, I think we're very clear on those issues of digitalization uh, as well as uh, climate change and the Green Deal. Um, I think it's very important to say that uh, what we have tried to deliver all through this manifesto is policies that work on the ground and that address the concerns that people have in their daily life. So it's not abstract, it's very concrete. Mm -hmm. And then when I think about, for example, energy, 
right? Um, my granddad was a coal miner, so his Europe was the Europe of coal and steel. And that is what was needed then at the time to rebuild the economy yeah. and to assure peace at the same time. Now, fast forward 70 years, the world looks completely different. And what we need is renewable energy. It is low carbon energy to fight climate change, to ensure our energy for our industries, uh, but also uh, to become less dependent on Russia. So uh, we catch three birds with one stone if we invest in our energy policy. And on the Green Deal, we are very keen as EPP to make this a pact that delivers for people. So we want to be technology open. Uh, we want to support SMEs really as the backbone of our economy. And we want to make sure that farmers can produce what is our daily bread. Uh, I go back to 70 years ago when we were rebuilding Europe after the war. It's not a coincidence that besides coal and steel, um, we tackled agriculture as one of the first things, because on an empty stomach, you don't build an economy. And that is still relevant today. Um, and therefore, I think it's, it's, it's very important that we have this grounded attitude when it comes to delivering, at the same time, the ambition that we need to deliver on issues like the Green Deal and digitalization. So the idea is, is that these, these priorities aren't necessarily mutually exclusive, as in some previous years they have been presented in other parts of the world. No, they very much belong together. We've said as EPP from the beginning that something like the Green Deal, which is hugely ambitious, and we need to be to deliver for the next generations. As Christian Democrats, that is what we want to do. We want to leave this planet in a good shape. But you need to combine this ambition with protection. You need to merge climate policy or combine it at least with a strategic green industrial policy. Because in the end, we want it to be a growth policy. We want it to be, to be delivering jobs for people made in Europe. Thank you very much, uh, Vice President de Lange. Um, Treasurer Hangel, it's time to come to you. Um, the EU way of life that we've just uh, described is one that many other countries around the world um, are keen to emulate and indeed be part of. Uh, we had uh, big positive news on Ukraine at the end of last year and its potential membership alongside um, Moldova, Georgia. What's this roadmap like for enlargement and how is, how is it going to play with this concept of more solidarity that's inside the manifesto? Okay, uh, first, uh, once when we speak about enlargement, we have always Ukraine in, also in our eyes. Let me condemn in a very, very harsh way the attack that today took place near Odessa and uh, that uh, was targeting uh, President Zelensky and our very, very good uh, Prime Minister Mitsotakis. Mm -hmm. uh, then, uh, this being said, what I would say is that after the invasion of Ukraine, we have uh, a new impulse for enlargement. Yeah. So first we should take care, of course, of the uh, uh, countries of Western Balkans mm -hmm. that were already on track and that have uh, waited uh, for a long time. And so to take this opportunity to relaunch this process, uh, what is taking, uh, uh, I'd say, really steps and good steps now. Then we have Ukraine, uh, first the candidate status, uh, now the uh, opening of negotiations. The same applies to Moldova. And uh, I think this is a very important uh, moment to open the negotiations now, to start uh, dossier by dossier, issue by issue, file by file negotiating. Then we have also the situation of Georgia. This is a bit different, but now they are already a candidate uh, uh, status, uh, in a candidate status, so they are candidates to European Union. So this is really very important. Then, what should we do? What is the roadmap? Uh, in the case of Ukraine, it's clear that we are uh, uh, opening these negotiations file by file, but we are aware that the war situation is a concern. So probably we will have to consider some uh, partial integration as we have made with some products or with some access to the single market. Uh, so uh, we have to wait, of course, for the end of the war, but we should prepare everything before that moment. And of course, uh, uh, this uh, is 
I'd say, related uh, with the idea that we need a clear victory in this war. This is essential. Second point, uh, with Moldova and with, with the others to proceed in negotiations, but at the same time, and that is in our roadmap of EPP, we have to do our own institutional and financial reforms. So to have a European Union where we'll have 33, 34 member states, the situation will be quite different from this one uh, where we have 27. And so we will need to reform our institutional procedures and our financial, I'd say, uh, uh, environment in order to allow that these countries can join the European Union. So we have to do, at the same time, the negotiations with the candidates and the internal reform of procedures and probably even of some institutions that could imply a treaty change or not. This is uh, uh, still uh, on discussion. EPP is in favor of a treaty reform, but naturally what we want is the progress uh, in terms of internal procedures to allow that we can receive these countries. Yes, in fact, we heard uh, Vice President Tajani refer earlier to the, the treaties as well and, and prospect for um, campaigning for reform. Um, just if I may ask you, enlargement, for somebody who's um, reading your manifesto and, and you know, going to the polls in 2018, how do you think it will change the landscape? Well, I think that this is a major geopolitical global uh, development. Because if you have a European Union that goes from Dublin to Tbilisi, from Lisbon to Kiev, from uh, Stockholm to uh, Chisinau, uh, this is a, a new entity where you have uh, 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 also uh, an ambition uh, that I say uh, uh, to be the old continent and so to have also a say in the Asian development. So uh, we will be the European continent with the Atlantic partnership but also with some capacity to influence uh, the, this, I'd say, emerging uh, power that is Asia where we have China, where we have India, where we have uh, a big part of the Russian Federation. And so for Europe, this will give us this capacity uh, of dealing with this uh, big, the biggest continent that is really Asia. So I think that in terms of world powers, there will be with enlargement a major achievement for European Union because we won't be only seen as, I say, a subcontinent of the Eurasiatic uh, uh, huge uh, space that has uh, uh, very, very close ties to Atlantic, but also a, a, a power that can influence the developments, the political developments, the economic developments in the Asian continent. Vice President Suica, could I ask you to just um, address some of those points of how a changing larger EU in the future um, will respond to its individual citizens' needs? You know that uh, we organized conference on the future of Europe, which was exactly what you asked about. And we have proposals from this conference on the future of Europe. And uh, it's not easy to change, but we have been changing slightly together with other institutions, with European Parliament and with European Council. But we have to mention the democracy here also, because if we don't build democratic resilience from within, we don't know what could happen. So what we, what we have been trying to do, to start teaching our citizens, our youngsters from the very early age, to differentiate what is fake, what is true, what is information, what is disinformation, because we are under attack of hybrid threats, of, uh, so we have to think about cybersecurity, and it especially is important when we talk about children, because it's, uh, and it is both for online and offline situations. So this is very important, and we are trying 
to build this democratic resilience from within, it is absurd to say today that we have to defend our democracy because we thought democracy is here, but it's not any more business as usual. It's, it cannot be taken for granted. So we have to really to defend our democracy in order to stay uh, strong and powerful. And this is especially very important for European People's Party. And I think we are on the front line of this. Just a final thought from you, um, Vice President Delanga. We were just talking there about defending democracy and the EU institutions from within, reform that might be needed inside before the EU enlarges. How do you view that transformation? Well, that's hugely important and, and something we need to repeat time after time. And I'm very grateful to Commissioner Suitsa that she does so uh, tirelessly, I think, wherever I see her. Because something like democracy, something like the rule of law, we can't see it, we can't touch it. We take it for granted, for granted and it makes it incredibly vulnerable in a way. If nobody is standing up for it, if nobody is defending it, and I come from a country where a very right-wing party just became the biggest in the national elections. If nobody says out loud, this is not a good thing, I'm in the Dutch. end, we will all <laughs> lose, uh, you know, um, then Europe will lose. Yep. So this is hugely important. And, and we're coming to the end of, of our first day of the Congress. And I think there is no better issue uh, to end with than, than a call to everyone present here, I think, um, to always defend the democracies that we have built in Europe. Thank you very much, Vice President Suitsa, and also uh, Treasurer Hangel. Thank you very much. That closes our third and final panel talking about solidarity, um, which is included in the manifesto.